Hey guys, it's time for another defect video. This time I will analyze the small zone technique and explain to you what it is, where it can be applied, and I will use graphical constructions and simulations with the help of the programming language Python to provide evidence that it works. Let me first define what I mean with small zone. I'm talking about this snap zone and this snap zone on the snap hut. The general rule, if you want to maximize acceleration, is placing your crosshair between the minimum Siegis line, which is green in this clip, and the border to the next snap zone. The logical conclusion would be that you can only aim at the small zone when the minimum Siegis line enters the small zone. This requires a lot of accuracy and timing. An alternative for that is the small zone technique where you place your crosshair into the small zone, although Seagas hasn't entered the small zone yet. In the specific situation that you can see in the clip, the acceleration from utilizing the small zone technique is even higher than the acceleration that you would get from the classic technique. Whether it is superior or not depends on multiple factors. One of them is the current speed, and the other factor is the distance between the minimum Seagas line and the border of the small zone. The higher the speed and the higher the distance between the border and the minimum Seagas line, the worse the small zone technique gets compared to the classic technique when we look at acceleration. However, if we want to evaluate the usefulness of the small zone technique, we can't only look at the acceleration, we also have to take into account the effects of the technique on routing and positioning. Since a large proportion of the acceleration of this technique is directed to the sides. And the truth is that there is barely any reason to apply the small zone technique on normal maps, which is why I am mainly talking about its application on straight strafe. Another limitation is shown in this clip. The technique can only be used when the sea gas lies between the small zone and the big colored zone. It does not work when the Seagas line lies between the two small zones, and we will soon see why. Some of you might remember the video Snaps by Tachyon, and the graphic that is shown in this video. It shows the snap zones from above and how different accelerations are rounded, or in other words, snapped to certain values. In the real world, the direction of an acceleration doesn't have an influence on the acceleration itself. This concept can be expressed with the help of a circle. In defrag, however, certain accelerations are rounded to the same value, even when they are heading into different directions. For example, all accelerations on this part of the circle are rounded to this acceleration. From the perspective of a player that would be in the middle of the circle, those accelerations would form a snap zone. Other accelerations would be rounded to another value, which would form another snap zone. Let's say that the orange arrow is the current movement direction, and the green line shows the minimum Seagas line. The room below the green line could be where you can place your crosshair to accelerate. This is how the situation could look like in-game. Now we could use a black line to draw in the intended acceleration. No matter where exactly you place your crosshair between the small zone and the minimum Seagas line, the acceleration is the same, because they are all rounded to the same value. Now let's draw in the acceleration that you would get from aiming at the small zone. In this picture I drew both accelerations with two red lines, the left one being the small zone acceleration and the right one being the acceleration that would actually occur in the picture. We can see that although the centers of the two snap zones are quite far away from each other, the actual accelerations that result from the two snap zones are quite close to each other. And if we look on the snap zone map again, we can see that the length of the small zone acceleration is higher than the length of the normal acceleration. 
we can conclude that although the angle at which the small zone acceleration is applied to the current velocity is larger, the acceleration itself is larger too. Therefore, it is evident that the small zone technique is beneficial in this situation. Let's do the same analysis when the Seegers line is located between the two small zones. In this case, the angle between the two accelerations is really big and it is immediately apparent that the small zone technique does not work in this situation because even at low speeds, we are applying an acceleration at almost 90 degrees. This is how the two accelerations would look like on the in-game HUD. Up until now, we have had some interesting perspectives on the issue, but let's dig a level deeper and get into actual numbers and simulations. It all started when I saw this clip that the French defragger bips made. Let's say that you are always striving with the perfect angle, that means placing your crosshair between the minimum Seagus line and the border to the next snap zone. Then the acceleration that your model experiences would be shown on the y-axis. Depending on your movement direction, that is shown on the x-axis. Bips simply made one picture for speeds that are integers and compiled them in a video. The graph looks quite complex and a bit like the sawtooth graph that you would have expected if you have some experience with acceleration in this game. If there was no velocity snapping in Quake 3, then the graph would just be a horizontal line that is parallel to the x-axis. Fortunately, there is velocity snapping, which opens up a whole new world of complexity. That's how Bips inspired me to write a code that can simulate the movement physics for a lot of situations in Defrag. To simplify the simulations, we just assume that we are straving at the minimum angle which can be shown in this clip with the help of a strafe bot. Okay, this is how my code looks like in Python. And there are even bars implemented in the plot to display the snap zones. At the position of the very left small zone, you can see that the acceleration is really high. But at the position of the small zone next to it, as expected, the acceleration is lower. Already before I finished writing the code, I realized that it could be used to calculate the effectiveness of the small zone technique. My idea was that you could calculate the plot for a constant angle that is added to the minimum angle and then subtract the accelerations from the graph of the minimum angle technique. On average, the first graph will have a lower acceleration but for certain points in time, specifically when the crosshair points at the small zones, the acceleration of the first graph will be higher. And since we are plotting the difference function of the two plots, we will see that for those points, the difference is larger than zero. So let's make it clear again. The first technique that I was referring to is the minimum angle technique, and the second technique is what I call the added angle technique. And basically, the small zone technique is nothing else than the added angle technique for very specific points in time. Those points in time where the added angle technique is actually beneficial. Now let me show you the graph for the difference of the two techniques. When I assume an added angle of 13 degrees and a speed of 628 units per second, then you can clearly see two spikes in the graph. Those are the spikes of the small zone technique. And it is a clear proof that the technique is superior in this situation. As I said before, the effectiveness of the small zone technique depends on the distance between the green seagas line and the border to the next snap zone. This distance can be translated into the added angle of the added angle technique. So what is the most extreme angle at which the small zone technique could still be useful? The situation in which this angle occurs can be seen in the following frame. To make use in this frame, you would have to put your crosshair into the small zone 
as soon as Seagas line crosses the left border of the big colored zone. This is not humanly possible, but I want to simulate that situation anyway. The distance that I'm showing in the clip translates into an angle of around 23 degrees. I put this value into the code and let it calculate the speed where the small zone technique stops being superior to the minimum angle technique. As it turns out, this threshold speed is 572 UPS, which is lower than the typical landing speed of a circle jump. And since we are faster in the frame that you can see, the small zone technique is already inferior at such a low speed, when the applied angle is too big. Up until now, I have only proven concepts that I know work based on practical experience. However, I could finally answer the question if the small zone technique can be used during straight strafe at around 900 to 1200 UPS. You can see it in my world record run on Undead 021. Now, what's so special about the speed range from 900 to 1200 UPS? As I said, when using the small zone technique, you get a lot of sideways acceleration. This also means that the minimum line of Seagas moves faster if you use this technique. A big challenge during straight strafe is having enough space in the snap zones, so you use one zone for one jump. The faster you are, the smaller the gap that is available. At 1200 UPS, it is inevitable that the minimum Seagas line crosses the border of the small zone. For the speeds that are lower than that, however, you could use the small zone technique. In my straight strafe guides, I argued that at first the small zone technique works, but it increases the distance between the minimum Seagas line and the small zone after you switch. To answer the question if it's worth after all, I wrote a code that can simulate this situation. On the right you can see two graphs. Those are simply the paths for the two techniques during a straight strafe run. I need them to adjust the variables apart from speed, so the path has a forward direction and doesn't go diagonal. So what does the code do? The first path is a minimum angle technique path, and the second path is a hybrid between a minimum angle technique and a small zone technique. Basically, I'm saying that right before landing, let's say for five frames, the minimum angle technique transitions into a small zone technique, because this is basically what I'm doing during those world record runs. And although I use this during my world record runs, it turns out based on the simulations, that this technique is actually inferior to the really simple minimum angle technique. When we compare the two techniques side by side, it turns out that the minimum angle technique reaches 1230 UPS in my simulation, and at the same time the small zone technique has reached just 1212 UPS. Accordingly, the minimum angle technique has a further end position compared to the small zone technique. You may ask now why I am still using this technique if I know that it's not useful after all. The answer is quite simple. The comparison relies on the assumption that both techniques are executed perfectly, which is obviously not humanly possible. When you try to execute the minimum angle technique perfectly, Every time the Seagas line catches up with your crosshair, you are left with no acceleration at all. The alternative for that is doing the small zone technique, which is a bit worse for acceleration, but which doesn't result in the Seagas line touching your crosshair. Another reason for utilizing the small zone technique during straight strafe is the positioning and the sideways acceleration. If you've watched some of my demos, you can see that I almost always fall off on the left side of the map. And even if I don't fall off the edge, it's a big psychological influence for the later parts of the run. And every technique that could position you more to the right would lead to much less acceleration and thus to a much worse time. One solution is starting the small zone technique when I'm straving to the right. 
I find the influence on the path to be actually significant. Another situation where I apply the small zone technique to correct the path is not when the straight path lies too much on the left, which is what I just described, but when I'm straving in a path that is a bit diagonal. In this case, you can straighten the path with the small zone technique. Okay guys, that was my analysis of the small zone technique and I hope it was somewhat understandable and not too advanced or too much different from the terminology that you, the listener, or other people use. See you guys.